The sextant, probably one of the most recognisable pieces of navigational equipment. Safe to say you can't honestly call yourself a navigator until you've actually mastered it. Luckily it's a lot simpler than it looks, so we'll take a look at it together. We're going to have to break it down into three tutorials. This video we're going to look at parts of a sextant, the operational principles, and just generally how it works. Next time we're going to look into sources of error and methods for correcting them. And then the final video we're going to cover actually taking a site with it. I would advise watching all the way through as understanding the principles will really help when you're using it in anger. So let's start off looking at the parts of the sextant. The foundation of the instrument is its frame. The frame can be made of metal or plastic and just acts to hold everything together. It's important for the frame to be solid as it allows the instrument to be as precise as possible. Generally a metal sextant will maintain accuracy better than a plastic one, and that's just down to the rigidity of the frame. But the big advantage of a plastic one is that it's cheaper. It's the shape of the frame that gives the sextant its name. It covers about a sixth of a circle or 60 degrees, with the Latin being sextants. At the bottom of the frame you've got the scale. Notice how the scale runs from 0 to 120 degrees, even though the sextant itself only covers 60 degrees. This is because of the double reflection principle which the sextant employs to take its measurements, and we're going to come onto that shortly. Attached to the frame is the index arm, and the index arm is the main moving part of the sextant, and you use it to actually take your measurements. At the lower end of the arm, you can see that it lines up with the scale, so you can read off your actual measurement. At the bottom of the index arm is a vernier scale and a micrometer drum. These are used, along with the main scale, to get a very precise measurement. The sextant should be able to measure angles to within 0.1 minutes with the vernier scale. Next to the vernier scale is a clamp, and the clamp is used to release that scale so that the index arm can move freely. And you'll need to release the scale using the clamp when you're wanting to take a sight. But we're going to cover that in the third video when we're looking at taking sights. The mirror that's attached to the index arm is the index mirror. It's attached rigidly to the arm so that it moves as the arm rotates. And the scale that we looked at is related to the angle that you use the index arm and consequently this index mirror. The second mirror is the horizon mirror and it's attached rigidly to the frame. You can see that this mirror is part mirror and part see-through. This is because you need to be able to see both the horizon straight ahead and the reflection of the celestial body that you're trying to measure. And this will become clear again in video 3 when we're actually taking measurements. Some sextants will have a semi-silvered mirror instead, and this makes this sextant a little easier to use, but it increases the cost. Opposite the horizon mirror you have the telescope. The telescope lines up with the horizon mirror so that you can see down the sights and see straight through it. Notice the angle that the horizon mirror is mounted at, it means that when you're looking down the telescope, the reflection in the horizon mirror is the index mirror. Finally, in front of each mirror you've got a set of shades, and you need to use these when taking sights, particularly sights of the sun, so that you can protect your eyes. If you don't use the shade, you can actually burn your eyes, and this is why so many old sailors would wear an eye patch. So we've assembled the sextant, but how does it actually work? This is where the sextant principle comes in. When the sextant is set at zero, looking straight at the horizon, you can see that both mirrors are looking at the exact same spot. The image in both parts of the horizon mirror should be identical. When you start to rotate the index arm, the image in the reflected part of the horizon mirror changes. The angle along the scale corresponds with the angle between the objects that you're looking at. You see how the scale will measure all the way to 120, not just the 60 degrees that the frame covers. And this is the sextant's unique selling point, its operational principle. The sextant works on the scientific principle of double reflection. With basic reflection, the angle of incidence, I, equals the angle of reflection, R. The angle of incidence is the angle between the normal, which is the line perpendicular to the plane of the mirror, and the incoming ray of light. The angle of reflection is the same but for the reflected ray. When you introduce a second mirror parallel to the first, you can see the ray of light continues with all the same angles I and R. Due to the law of reflection, we know that I and R are both equal, so we can actually just call them I to keep things simple. 
But as soon as that second mirror is no longer parallel to the first, an interesting effect occurs. Let's rotate our second mirror now by an angle, which we're going to call X. The ray of light still interacts with the original mirror in the same way. But now, when it hits the second mirror, the angle of incidence has changed. It's now I plus X. And then due to the law of reflection, the angle of incidence equaling the angle of reflection, the angle of reflection here equals I plus X as well. If we look solely at the second mirror, the total deflection of the ray of light is I plus X plus I plus X. And rearranging this gives I plus I plus 2X. Compared to the first mirror, the difference is 2x. Overall, the reflected ray has been deflected by twice as much as the angle between the mirrors. This is the sextant principle. When a ray of light is reflected by two mirrors in succession, the angle between the incoming and outgoing ray of light is twice the angle between the mirrors. Now that we understand the principle, we can head back to the sextant and see it properly in action. We've already said that when set at zero degrees, both rays of light come from the same direction. If we change the angle between the mirrors, say we rotate the index arm by 20 degrees, the rays of light now come from different directions. Although the angle between the mirrors is only 20 degrees, the angle between the rays of light is 40 degrees. This is that double reflection principle in action. The scale at the bottom has been calibrated to give the angle between the rays of light not the direct angle of rotation of the index arm. This is why the scale reads all the way to 120 degrees across just 60 degrees of index arm rotation. Just look at that angle that the sextant can measure at its extreme setting. This is the sextant's huge advantage over the instruments that came before it. So now we understand all the principles. In the next video, we can look at the sources of error and how to correct them before we move on to taking an accurate reading. There are actually many different errors possible on a sextant. We can split them into two different groups, correctable and non-correctable. One error, collimation, actually used to be correctable, but on modern sextants it's more usual for it to be non-correctable nowadays. Let's start by looking at the non-correctable errors. We'll just go through quickly as you can't correct for them anyway. Centering error, this is when the pivot point of the index arm is not perfectly aligned with the centre of the instrument. Prismatic error is when the two planes of the mirrors or glass planes are not parallel to each other. Shade error is the same thing, but it's for the shades and it, it causes a slight deflection in the ray of light as it passes through the glass pane. Graduation error is to do with inaccuracies in the graduations of the scale, the vernier or the micrometer drum. Worm and rack is effectively the wearing of the cogs that control the fine movement of the index arm. And collimation error, this is that one that was correctable on older sextants, is caused when the axis of the telescope is not perfectly perpendicular to the plane of the instrument. Nowadays the telescope is normally rigidly fixed to the frame, so it's not actually possible to correct. And finally we've got instrument error. This is actually just total of all the non-correctable errors that we've already discussed. It gives the user an easy way to apply all those manufacturing errors to their readings. Sextants come with a calibration card, which gives this instrument error. In theory, the error should be negligible. But you can see from this example card that as the sextant reaches its extreme setting, you do need to take account of the instrument error. Now we can move on to the correctable errors. For the correctable errors, you need to correct them in the right order. First, you've got the error of perpendicularity. This describes the error caused when the index mirror is not perpendicular to the plane of the instrument. To check for perpendicularity error, you set the index arm part way, say 30, 40 degrees, and then you look straight across the plane of the instrument so that you can see the arc both directly and reflected in the index mirror. You're looking for the real and reflected arcs to appear continuous and flat. As you can see, this mirror is set perfectly, and that's just because it's a computer generated model. As I introduce some perpendicularity error, you can see the change in the view. The arc no longer appears continuous. There's a visible step between the two. To correct this error, you just use the adjustment screw. One useful tip for the adjustment screws in my method of correction is that you'll always be adjusting the screw that is at the top of the mirror in relation to the way you are holding the sextant. 
as you have to hold the sextant on its side to see this error, the screw on the side of the index mirror appears on top, so that's the one that you adjust. All you need to do is turn it one way or the other until the real and reflected views of the arc appear in a straight line. Once they do, you know that the index mirror is perpendicular to the plane of the instrument and is correct. Next, we're going to move on to side error. This is similar to the last error that we looked at, but it's for the horizon mirror instead. So side error is when the horizon mirror is not perpendicular to the plane of the instrument. You can spot side error when the instrument is set at zero and you look at an object in the distance. If the real object and the reflected object are separated, side error is present. You'll notice the correction screws on the horizon mirror are not the same as those on the index mirror. The screws on the horizon mirror actually correct for both side error and index error. We're going to need to correct for both at the same time. So what's index error then? Index error is when the index mirror and the horizon mirror are not parallel to each other when the instrument is set at zero. If you set the instrument to zero and look through the telescope at the horizon, you can spot any index error. If there's a step in the horizon, index error is present. This is why index error and side error need to be corrected together. If you have a sextant with both errors present, images in the telescope will be displaced both horizontally and vertically. The horizontal displacement is due to the side error, and the vertical displacement is due to the index error. Now, everyone has their own way of correcting for these, for me, the simplest way is to just use the horizon. My reasoning is that for almost all sites, you're going to need the horizon anyway, so it should be visible, and it's obvious and easy to find. So, I start by setting the instrument to zero. I want everything to be lined up perfectly when the instrument is set at zero. Then, you can just look down the telescope straight at the horizon. You remember we already did this to check for index error doesn't really matter at this point if index error is present or not, because as we adjust for side error, we're going to change the index error anyway. At this angle, you can't tell about side error, because it's not possible to tell if there is a horizontal displacement. You could rotate the sextant by 90 degrees, which would effectively give you a vertical line to tell you about side error, but that's not actually necessary. All you need to do is to tilt your head slightly and any side error will show itself with the real and reflected horizons moving apart. Obviously, if you've got a lot of index error to start with, it's harder, so you may have to tilt your head over to 90 degrees, so that all of the error that's visible is side error, and none of it is index error. Normally, a 45 degree head tilt will be plenty. From this position, you just adjust the screw that is furthest from the frame. I tilt my head to the right, so this screw is now on top. Just turn it one way or the other until the horizon forms a continuous line again. As you bring the sextant back to its normal angle, the horizons may separate again. If they do, this is now due to the index error. Again, you adjust the screw that is on the top. This time, it is the one that is nearest the frame. Turn one way or the other until the horizon is again continuous. Then you return to your tilted head position to check whether you've introduced more side error. If so, you can correct for that again. Now you repeat this process a few times until you've eliminated both side error and index error. You may get to a point where you can't eliminate both. If you find that you're just going back and forth between the two positions, you've taken out as much error as it's possible to remove. From here, just make sure your side error is eliminated. Then, any residual index error will have to be removed mathematically. You effectively measure that final little bit of index error by using the micrometer drum to make the horizon continuous. Then any measurements you take will need to have that index error applied to them. If the error is measured on the arc, you label it on the arc, and it needs to be subtracted from all the measurements to make them true. Likewise, if the error is off the arc, you label it such, and it needs to be added to all measurements to make them true. What we're going to do is measure the altitude of this red body. I've just coloured it red to make it easier to see the technique that we're going to use. The altitude is just the angular distance between the body and the horizon as measured from the observer's position. In this case, the sextant is the observer. So the first step is to set the index arm and micrometer drum to zero or as close to zero as possible. 
If you have a small index error, of course, zero on the scale will not quite be zero according to the instrument. At this point, it doesn't really matter because you're going to apply index error at the end. While set at zero, the instrument is basically just a telescope. You can look through the sights and see an image. As the instrument is like a telescope, you'll obviously need protection when looking at bright objects. This mainly applies when you look at the sun, but do be careful if you're looking at anything really, because they can be surprisingly bright. You can use these shades as eye protection. There are a set in front of each mirror, named accordingly, so you've got the horizon shades and the index shades. You will need to use both for proper protection. If I aim straight at our body and apply one of the index shades, you can see half of the image is suitably dimmed. If we now swap over and apply a horizon shade instead, you can now see the other half of the image is dimmed. Applying both a horizon shade and an index shade gives you full protection. It's safest to start with all of the shades across, and then you gradually remove them until you can see a clear image. With experience, you'll gradually learn the best combination for different situations. If the body is dim enough, you may not need any shades, and I'm actually going to remove them all for this example just to help with the clarity of the explanation in the video. So, for the sight, you start by looking straight at the celestial body, with shades adjusted as necessary. With the sun, it's easy, but with stars, they may take a little bit of finding. You will want the body aligned right in the middle of the image, half of it reflected, and half of it true. But, here is one of my little tricks. While you continue setting up the sight, actually get the image in the middle of the horizon mirror instead. It will make it way easier to stay focused, especially on a small star or something hard to see. We'll align it properly when it comes to the fine adjustment at the end. Next, you want to get hold of the clamp at the bottom of the index arm. This will allow you to move the index arm freely. Have a little practice wiggle just to see how the image in the horizon mirror actually moves when you're moving the index arm. Then you want to start to bring the entire instrument down, aiming it towards the horizon. At the same time, you want to use that clamp to move the index arm and keep the celestial body in the centre of the horizon mirror. Once you reach the horizon, you want that to be in the middle as well. For the final part, you bring the celestial body to the centre of the image. You will normally find there's a little optical quirk here that means you can see both the horizon and the body if you have it right in the center. That doesn't work in my example, as this is all computer generated. Once you've got it as close as possible with the clamp, you can then use the micrometer to do the final fine adjustment to bring the body in line with the horizon. At this point, if you use the shades, you might find that you need to remove one of the horizon shades to make the horizon easier to see. Just be certain you're removing correct shade, otherwise a bright body could burn your eyes. With a star, it's easy to line up a tiny dot of light, but with a large body like the sun, or our red sphere here, it can be a lot harder. Almanacs usually give an upper limb and a lower limb measurement, so you can line up the top and the bottom respectively. In this case, I've aligned the lower limb with the horizon. When you think it's all lined up, you should slowly rock the sextant from side to side, keeping it pointed straight ahead. The celestial body will appear to follow a path in the image. All you're doing is checking the sextant was perfectly upright when you took the sight. If it was upright, the body will just kiss the horizon at the lowest point on its rocking path. If it wasn't upright, the body would drop slightly below the horizon. If this happens, you just need to use the vernier again to make the lowest point on the path just kiss the horizon. Now you've got the sight properly set in the sextant, and you can just read off the measurement from the scale arc and the vernier. Any index error then needs to be applied to get the correct reading. For example, say you measure a body's altitude at 12 degrees 25.2 minutes, and you have an index error of 1.5 minutes off the arc. You need to add those 1.5 minutes to your measurement. Your altitude then becomes 12 degrees 26.7 minutes. Likewise, if your error was on the arc instead, you just subtract it from your measured altitude. And now that brings us to the end of this sextant tutorial series. Hopefully you found all the information useful and are now able to take sights using your own sextant. If you have any questions or suggestions for further tutorials, just let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, until next time, thank you for watching and goodbye.